Hey guys, welcome to the Love Stick Scribe podcast. So you may notice today that I don't have an excerpt from my blog post that I've read, nor do I have the niceties of the intro music and the pre-recorded introduction to the podcast to ease into the topic and transition. So I wanted to do things a little different today. And I wanted to talk about a topic that may be sensitive for some people, especially if you're familiar with this topic of inner healing. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because this is something that is really practiced and promoted in some of the charismatic, maybe even the hyper charismatic uh, circles. I personally did not have any dealings with this, but I knew about it. And even before coming out of what I did, I had some reservations about it. And I didn't know much about it. I was ignorant about it, but knew about it. And I knew that there was a mixed bag of emotions and and opinions about it. There were people that raved about it, said it was helpful for them, that it blessed them and helped them to grow more intimate with God. um, Some people said they had to go through it every few years to get healing and deliverance. We're going to talk about that in a biblical approach at the end of this. But there were also other people that were very hesitant about it. And that's the area that I was in, the camp I was in, even in the, in the hyper-charismatic, is I was very hesitant about it because uh, I could even see some of the natural dangers in it. And so coming out of what I did, one of the things I started doing was researching. And this was one of the topics I began to research. I wanted to find out more about it and why people wanted to do it, why they gravitated towards it, why they believed in it so much. And lo and behold, there were things that I found that really troubled me and disturbed me. And I read this old book by Dave Hunt called um, The Seduction of Christianity. And in it, he mentioned a lady named Agnes Sanford and mentioned that she was the pioneer or the mother of inner healing. Now, I had never heard her name before. And so I began doing my own research. And one of the things I did was I purchased some of her old books that were secondhand books from a website. And I read a couple of them. And I did that because I wanted to see where she was coming from, how she wrote. And this is a woman that's not talked about a whole lot. Usually when you talk about inner healing, you hear names like Lauren Sanford. Uh, You may hear the term Sozo that was coined and originated by Bethel Church. You may hear Theophostic Prayer, uh, the Father's Ladder, which is, um, I think it's part of Sozo, if I'm not mistaken. And the inner healing, which inner healing is basically the healing of memories is what that is. It's essentially boiling down to the healing of memories. There's even some psychological traces in this that were practiced and probably still are to this day in the realm of psychology. But I want to talk about Agnes Sanford today. I read two of Agnes Sanford's books. And what I found in there, I'm going to read some quotes to you and just talk a little bit about her history and help you to understand the root of inner healing. This is whether you call it theophostic prayer, whether you call it sozo, inner healing, deliverance, whatever you call it, this practice roots is is rooted and sourced out from this woman now this woman I believe passed away um, maybe in the 1960s I'm not sure but I know that one of her books in 1947 the healing light was one of the most popular books that she wrote and that was actually one of the ones that I read and so I want to share some of these things with you today and get you thinking And you may get upset with me. You may turn off this podcast. I certainly hope not. I hope that as if you're a Christian and you are professing faith in Jesus Christ and maybe you have strong convictions about sozo and inner healing, I hope that you will listen to this till the end and that you will test what I'm saying, that you will do your own research, that you will search it out and test it against scripture. We never, uh, we are never told to take our experiences Though they may seem very real and they seem very genuine and we want to take our experiences a lot of times and put such weight on them and almost make equate them with the Bible sometimes. And we may not mean to do that, but sometimes we'll take our experiences and we'll say, well, this was real. I experienced this and you're not going to take it away from me. And I would just challenge you with this as I've challenged myself over the past year with some of my own experiences that I've had to test and be honest with against scripture and see if they were truly biblical or not is our experiences do not interpret scripture and our experiences do not judge scripture in fact scripture interprets and judges our experiences and we could say that a person that goes to a psychic they would easily try to argue well that person read my mail they they knew things about me that the experience was real that what happened to me i felt it i knew that was real and we would tell that person as a christian that is false. 
you cannot receive that because that is not from God, right? So our experiences are not valid just because we have them. As Christians, our responsibility is to test everything against Scripture. And if it doesn't pan out and it doesn't pass the test of that, then we reject it. So I read two of Agnes Sanford's books, and I want to share with you today what you may not know about inner healing. Inner healing, as I said, is the healing of memories. And Agnes Sanford was known as the mother of inner healing. She was even talked like that in Lauren Sanford's forward or introduction to one of his books on inner healing and deliverance. He credited her with being the pioneer for inner healing. She had a major role in his ministry in inner healing. So this is the root, the, the, the woman, that's Agnes Sanford, that came up with inner healing. She is the root from which theophostic prayer and sozo comes. Agnes grew up in China. She had missionary parents that served in China, and she was raised there much of her life. And while she was there, she was influenced by the Tao, which is also called the Force. She held to the belief that God is a force and the power of visualization. She held to that. She believed if you could visualize something, that that's what could happen. She talked of being made ill by negative vibrations, a healing self and others through positive vibrations. And we'll talk about that in just a minute in her book, The Healing Light. And you'll notice that some of the verbiage that she uses, though this book was touted as something that every Christian should read, in fact, this is not a book that every Christian should read. And the only reason why I read it was because I wanted to understand and make sure where she was coming from and to test it against Scripture. And what I, again, what I found was disturbing and troubling to me. She talked of being made ill by the negative vibrations, as we said, um, by healing herself through the positive vibrations. And when I think about that, if we're able to heal ourselves, here's a question that I'm going to just pose to you, and I want you to think about this. What is the point of praying to God and asking for healing if we have the ability in ourselves to heal ourselves? The Word doesn't tell us to do that. The Word tells us to ask God to make our petitions known, to seek Him, to trust in Him, to put our faith in Him, not faith in our words, not faith in our visualization, not faith in ourselves, but we are to put our faith and our hope and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And so, again, you're going to see some of these things as I talk that are not going to resonate with the Christian faith. So, you may be wondering, well, what is the basic teaching of inner healing? So, here it is. Basic, the basic teaching of inner healing is that salvation and healing come through uprooting negative memories buried in the subconscious that are dictating our behavior. There is a focus on being wronged by others rather than self. So this takes away accountability. It makes people almost into a victim somewhat. And I know people don't like that term, but essentially that's what it's doing, whether we use that terminology or not. It's making someone into a victim and it's ultimately taking away accountability and responsibility. We are each and every one of us responsible for our own actions, our own sins. And yes, there are people that do wrong us. There are people that do harm us. There are people that do things to us that are um, ungodly, that are not right. But we are also, on the other side, responsible for our reaction. We are responsible for our own behavior. We cannot blame someone else for that. Visualization is used to recreate the past event. This is a big thing in inner healing. There's a visualization that takes place. This happens in Sozo. There's a visualization of Jesus. That's a very dangerous thing to do, honestly. We are never told to do that in Scripture. Jesus is brought in as a spirit guide to sanctify the memory, to forgive the person, and even alter the reality of the memory in order to deliver them from the traumatic event and diseased memory. The memory is recreated. And Jesus is called upon to affirm or encourage. And the problem with this is that Jesus cannot be called upon to do these things. We don't tell God what to do. We don't give him instructions of what to do. And furthermore, to think that we can bring Jesus in as a spirit guide, which is an occultic practice, this is very dangerous. This is not something that should be practiced or should be done by Christians. The mentor of Agnes Sanford was Pastor Morton Kelsey. He was an Episcopal priest who studied at the Jung Institute and became a Jungian psychologist, which that alone should be alarming to you. Uh, Carl Jung, I believe, instead of Carl Jung, Carl Jung was actually not a Christian, and the practices that he had would not have been adopted by Christians. Morton Kelsey said this. He said that he had communicated with and had guidance from the dead. 
He equated shamanistic powers with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This was Agnes Sanford's mentor. So just keep that in mind. And again, this is not to defame pers- a person that's passed away. It's not to, to be disparaging in any way. But we are to test everything. When someone says that they are a Christian, especially, and they come to us with a foundational teaching that is adopted by a big percentage of professing Christians, then it needs to be tested, regardless of who says it, regardless of how many people they know, what their following is, if they're alive, dead, whatever. We need to test it. We are responsible for that because if we're perpetuating something to other believers in Christ and it is something that's bringing bondage and it's bringing another Christ and another gospel, we are going to be accountable for that. And that is a serious thing that we need to take into consideration and be made aware of. So I told you I read two of Agnes Sanford's books, right? And she wrote several books, but the first one I'm going to quote from, I'm not going to quote everything I read, but there were things as I went through and dog-eared and highlighted and underlined that I was just astounded. There were times that I sat with my jaw dropped because I could not believe what I was reading and even some of the endorsements from the book and comments about it to support the book that were saying, like I said, every Christian needed to read this. And this book was written in 1947 from The Healing Light. This is the most, her most well-known work that she had that, um, that she published. So I want to read some comments, some quotes from there directly from her book and talk a little bit about them with you. Here's some quotes from The Healing Light by Agnes Sanford, the pioneer or quote, mother of inner healing. The kingdom of God is within you, she says, and it is the indwelling light the secret place of the consciousness of the Most High that is the kingdom of heaven in its present manifestation on this earth. She says, when speaking of a man who was sick that she was to pray for, who was still ill, at this point, she says, quote, Satan entered me and I began to wonder whether it was God's will for him to die. Now, this is an interesting thing to say as a believer, as someone who's professing to be a Christian, is to say that Satan entered me. We only see that type of verbiage used with such people as Judas. And Judas, we know, was possessed by Satan. That's what that implies there. And to also imply that would mean that he was not a true believer. Judas was not a true believer. He was chosen by Jesus Christ to fulfill the prophecies that were spoken about him and about Judas hundreds of years before to fulfill prophecy for Christ to be crucified. So this type of verbiage, and it gets more disturbing from here, but this type of verbiage in and of itself is is rather troubling. Another quote she says, When ministering to a man with a broken bone who was not a Christian, She told that man, quote, ask that something come into you. Just say, whoever you are, whatever you are, come into me now and help nature in my body to mend this bone and do it quick. Again, a Christian would not talk like this. We would not say whoever you are, whatever you are, because we don't, that that type of verbiage is not directed to God. We are to direct our prayers to God. We don't, again, we don't command God to do anything. We don't demand, but then to say, whoever you are, whatever you are. Uh, as we see through here, you're going to see that there is a thing that she has. It, 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 I believe that she was a pantheist. She believed that God was in everything. She seems to be a universalist, as we'll see reading some quotes. So again, don't get upset with me. Just sit back, relax, listen, and take this in and test it. You're welcome to test it. She's, her summary of the prayer of faith, this is what she says about the prayer of faith. Choose the same time and the same place every day. Make yourself comfortable and relax. Remind yourself of the reality of a life outside yourself. Ask that life to come in and increase life in your body. Make a picture in your mind of your body well. This is a new age practice. Visualization is a new age and occultic practice. And so this is what's being portrayed here when she talks about the prayer of faith. She says, quote, we are the electric light bulbs through whom the light of God reaches the world. Thus, we are part God, end quote. The love vibrations and the faith vibrations of God enter through our thoughts of life and love. In the same way, destructive thought vibrations of Satan enter through our thoughts of illness, hate, and death. Those are actually not thought vibrations. That's called sin. And we, so we have to be honest about that and say it for what it is. We can't just pass the buck of uh, Satan does have a, he had a hand in sin, sin entering the world, but it was Adam who sinned and rebelled against God by doing what God said not to do. 
She, um, some other things that she says here is, speaking of early Christians, she says, quote, sadly, they postponed their glorious visions of a new heaven and a new earth. Sadly, they laid aside their hopes of being clothed upon with immortality and accepted death. Well, I think that Paul and uh, 11 of the 12 original apostles would disagree with Agnes Sanford to say that they postponed glorious visions of a new heaven and new earth. They knew that what was to come was an eternal promise. They looked towards the heavenly Jerusalem. They looked towards the heavenly city, and they were willing and glad to die for the sake of Christ. They were willing and glad to suffer for the sake of Christ because they knew that Scripture talked about that suffering is part of the life of a believer. And so for her to say such things, it diminishes the ministry that Jesus Christ appointed them to himself and promised them that they would uh, face persecution, they would face death, they would face trial and tribulation. Uh, To diminish their suffering for the sake of his name uh, is, is doing a disservice, it seems, to the gospel. And so there's, again, there's this mindset, um, almost like Gnosticism, really, too. There's a mixed bag of things going on here with Gnosticism, which was prevalent even in the first century, and the apostles fought against this with true biblical teaching and laying the foundation for the gospel in the New Testament, is Gnosticism always believed that the physical body was evil and that they were always reaching towards this higher power, this higher state, uh, this spiritual state that was much higher, and that the physical body, the carnal body, was was looked down upon. Um, so we'll move on from there. She calls Jesus, excuse me, she calls Jesus, quote, the teacher who was a most profound psychologist. Agnes said that, that our, quote, our love is working in harmony with the laws of nature. On forgiveness, this is what Agnes had to say. She said, quote, we merely permit him, which is who is Jesus, to carry on through us. Uh, she said, we are indeed made in his image and likeness. He is, first of all, a creator, and so are we. Actually, we're not. The Bible never tells us that we create. God is the one who creates. I know some people will disagree with this. They'll say, well, what about Romans 4.17? Well, when you read that scripture in context, you will note Romans 4.17 is not talking about us. Rather, this passage is talking about God. He is the one that calls things that aren't as though they were. And this is is the problem that we run into when we begin to take scripture out of its context, we rip it out of its context, and we begin to apply it to whatever we want it to mean. Another passage people will say is, decree a thing and it shall be so. That's from the book of Job. And when you look at that in context, again, one of Job's friends actually said that. And as we look at the end of Job, we look and see that God came to the three friends of Job and he was not happy with all the things that Job's friends had said. So we have to look at things in context. Never in scripture are we told that we can speak things into existence. We are not God. We are not little gods. We are not creators. We are the created beings and that we serve and that we worship a mighty and holy and just God. When ministering to a non-believer mother that regarding her child, this is what Agnes said to this mother. She said, quote, make the picture of the child as you want her to be. And say, my love brought this child into the world, and through my own mother love, I recreate her after this image. Here's a quote from this book, The Healing Light, that really backs up this idea of pantheism, that God is in everything. It says, when, when near a snake, while recalling a time outdoors, Agnes talked of being conscious of her oneness with God, and therefore with a snake. And so that goes back to a universalist, a pantheistic view that God is in everything. And so this is what she is equating this to. And if we were to be true and honest about this, this is not a Christian biblical belief or practice. So let's keep moving on through here. Another thing that was really disturbing to me, during prayer, she says that she prayed for at one with God or harmony. Now, she divided up the word atonement, and she is not the first person to do this. <laughs> She's probably not going to be the last. Uh, I do know of one particular person that's even prevalent today in, in ministry named Richard Rohr, who actually uses this term as well. But instead of saying atonement, which is what we are to embrace as what Christ did for us on the cross because of our sins. He atoned for our sins. He satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf because of our sins. She divides up the word with dashes, at one minute. And so this is creating a harmony or like an intimacy with God. 
and essentially stripping away the need for atonement or repentance. And we know that that is, again, not a Christian practice. She says, in order to make the sick mind well, the one who prays must believe unfalteringly that it will be well. The least shadow of doubt in his mind will blot out some of the sunlight of God's love. When dealing with repentance, she instructs people to prepare daily for confession, asking the Holy Spirit to throw the mind back into the nearest period and recall any unforgiven sins lingering in the subconscious. She likens them to splinters that may fester in the subconscious. She said, Jesus saw that we not only need his teaching, but also his life. He tried, this is her quote, this is her saying this, and this was one of the jaw-dropping things to me. She said, quote, Jesus tried saving people by his teachings alone, and it did not work. His principles were right, but they were continually short-circuited by the forces of evil in this world. God's love was blackened out from man by the negative thought vibrations of this sinful and suffering world. Nowhere in scripture are we told that Jesus tried to, to save people by his teachings and it didn't work. That would make a weak God that was unable to save. And we know that his teachings fulfilled the law and the words of the prophets. The things that he did, the miracles that he did, pointed to him as the Messiah, as the one to come to save from sins. And we know that he was all God and all man and that he never failed at anything. He was successful he said it was finished on the cross, and we believe by faith in him alone that he atoned for our sins and that what he did was finished and it was successful and it was in by no means of our own doing or anything that we could earn, but it was all based on what he did at the cross of Calvary and God raising him from the dead and him giving us eternal life when we repent on him and believe in his name. She said, our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane undertook the great work that we call the atonement, the at-one-ment, which reunited man with God. See, this is this intimacy of the at-one-ment or harmony, but again, it seems to be stripping away and dissecting away and disconnecting from the need for repentance. She said, he literally lowered his thought vibrations to the thought vibrations of humanity and received into himself man's thoughts of sin and sickness, pain and death. Again, I would encourage you to read the Bible, to open the scripture, and we'll talk about some scripture here at the end that's going to help give some clarity, and I hope and I do believe it's going to help some people to be free from believing some of these these things, these thought mindsets, and some people are going to get upset and really not be happy with what I'm saying right now, and it's okay, because ultimately, we are responsible for leading people back to Christ and telling the truth. We're not responsible for having people like us. We're not responsible for people's reactions. But we are responsible when we understand the truth and we've done our due diligence to look into something and to test it. We are responsible for sharing that information. And that is what I'm doing today. She said, some who read this book, The Healing Light, may not be able to accept this chapter. If so, they would be wise to lay it on the table, as it were, and proceed with their methods of self-help until such time as they need a deeper power. And if I could agree with her on one sentence, this would be the one, but it would not be because I can't receive it, in her understanding at least what it was, but it's because it's just not the truth. So as we go on, another, uh, I know I'm reading a lot of quotes from her today, but I just want you to take this in and just think about, again, why am I reading all these quotes? What does it all mean? Because it's helping you to understand the mindset of the person that's known as the pioneer of inner healing. If the root system is bad, the tree is not good. The fruit can't be good. If the root system is contaminated and diseased, then what's going to be produced is diseased. Jesus himself said, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And I know some people will say, well, I've been blessed by inner healing. I've had this and this and this happen and all these things. And I would again say, I understand, but your experiences do not interpret scripture. You need to test those things just because they feel right, just because you believe something to be so it has to be te tested by scripture. And if it doesn't pass it, then we have to reject it. And we have to come back to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come back to the truth of the word of God. She says, let us tell him, God, that we do not really understand the need for Calvary and ask him to help us understand it. And I remember seeing that and writing in the margin, what? With three question marks. I don't understand the need for Calvary. If I'm a believer in Christ and I 
in professing my faith in Christ, but yet I don't understand the need for Calvary as a wretched, depraved person, a sinner that was on my way to hell and that needed a Savior. That's the point of Calvary. I needed a Savior. If we don't understand that, that is a core understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then friends, I would say that people that profess Christ and they say these types of things, they don't know Christ. And that that's why we've got to proclaim the truth. And we do it in love. It's, it's, listen, I understand sometimes, well, not just sometimes, but a lot of times when we're speaking and ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, and even though we may use a pleasant tone and we're trying to be as loving as possible, the good news also has some harsh news in it. And the harshness is that we are sinners. We are children of wrath before we know God. We deserve the wrath of God. And that's why Jesus came. He came to reconcile us back to the Father through repentance and to save us from the wrath of God and to allow us a way to be adopted as children of God and give us the promise of eternal life. She says, if one wants to make sure that he will really receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in this way, which is confessional is what she means, because she dabbled in, she was part of the Episcopalian Church. She also dabbled in uh, Roman Catholicism, if I'm not mistaken. And again, she was uh, heavily involved with the Tao, the Chinese force. She dabbled in and did a lot of this. And so you're going to see as we go here in a minute that there is some universalism that comes into play. She says, if one wants to make sure that he will really receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in this way, confessional, she said he can ask a spiritual friend to pray for it to happen. Well, that's using another man as a mediator. And we know that the Bible tells us there is only one mediator, and that's laid out thoroughly in the book of Hebrews, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the the only mediator. There is no other mediator, nor Mary, nor Buddha, nor anybody else, nor other man, woman, child, beast, whatever. There is no other mediator to God the Father but Jesus Christ, who is the high priest, who ever intercedes for those that belong to God. She says, for the same reason that every Christian who believes in God does not receive healing, it is a lack of faith. Now, this is also an ad- 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 adoption of the word of faith type belief. And we will even see in scripture, there were people that had no faith, but yet they were healed. So, This strips away the sovereignty of God. It strips away not trying to understand the sovereignty of God and trying to understand uh, what is going on and that we don't always have the answers to everything, but God does. She talks of sending forth thoughts of power when talking of personal forgiveness before God. She talked about Christ consciousness as well. I want to read this quote to you from her book, The Healing Light. She said, quote, Think of the Christ, the Christ, as the Spirit of God that abides in all of us, and of Jesus only as the first demonstrator of that Spirit. Now see, there is a disconnect here. There's a division between Jesus and the Christ here. And I've, I've heard this teaching before, again, from modern-day ministers that, that uphold to this teaching. But there's a separation between Jesus and the Christ, quote. So they say that Jesus went to heaven, but the Christ Spirit stayed here, and he indwells everything. And again, that's that pantheistic view but becoming Christ conscious. When speaking of Jesus, she said this, We rise into the divinity of God through the humanity of Jesus. Nope, we don't. We don't have any divinity in us that is un-all God. She also said the redemption that work of receiving into himself the spirits of men, purging them of their sins through his own suffering and rechanging them into the love of God. He uses every bit of help that we can give him for he needs us. God does not need us. We need him. Yes, God loves us with an everlasting love. He is slow to anger. He is gracious. He is merciful. But he does not need us. We are in desperate need of him. When starting a prayer group, this is what Agnes said. She said, people often ask me, how do you start a prayer group? She says, I know of no way of starting a prayer group except to make my own prayers so powerful that a group naturally grows up around me. She says, to limit one's prayer for those in danger by the pious ejaculation, thy will be done, is merely to evade the responsibility. She said, we can cause his will to be done concerning our loved ones if we are willing to make the tremendous effort of being the conductors of love into the midst of hate. Let us ascertain his will and do it. We cannot cause the will of God. We cannot force his will. And again, the there is some disdain when people say thy will be done, even though our precious Savior prayed the same way in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though 
there were believers in the in the Acts of the Apostles that tried to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem and facing persecution. They prayed, "Thy will be the Lord's will be done in this matter." Though the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, when the disciples asked how to pray, part of the Lord's prayer is, "Thy will be done." There is some disdain that's said when people pray that way of God's will being done. This is a very difficult topic. We put our faith and our hope in Him. We have a great and amazing uh, uh, privilege and opportunity that God grants to us as believers to pray, to have an active role in praying to Him and asking Him for things and trusting Him in His sovereignty. I wanted to read a little bit more through here, and then we'll touch on the other book for just a minute and then touch on some scriptures. But one of the things about universalism, she says, is, quote, the world is so ordered that every person in it is inextricably bound up with the welfare of every other person. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Our thought vibrations are not limited by time or space. This is a concept of universalism. She said, quote, several times throughout this book, said that we were all one in Christ Jesus. We are not all one in Christ Jesus. Not all mankind is in Christ Jesus. As we know, the word tells us there are children of wrath that are their father is the devil. Uh, We know that there are people that are not saved, that they are given over to a reprobate mind that they have they have rejected God. So not everyone is, we are not all one in Christ Jesus. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. She said, God works through our, my faith. He cannot send his power through much speaking or through frantic pleading, but only through faith. She talks of repenting and doing penance for a particular world leader and t- taking them to the cross of Christ and receiving for them forgiveness, healing, and life. And again, we can pray. We can pray for other people, pray and uh, pray for mercy for and salvation, ask God to save them, ask God to heal people. We can. There's nothing wrong with praying that way. But when we're saying that we're taking them to the cross of Christ and that we're interceding for them and receiving for them forgiveness, we can't do that. We can't repent on their behalf. We're not able to do that. Every individual person is going to be an account give an account and be accountable for their own actions, the sins they've committed against a holy and just God. We cannot repent on someone else's behalf. So another quote is, when enough of us have offered sacrifices, this again goes along with the whole mediator thing of of us being a mediator and really still trying to adopt the law, it seems like, of the type and shadow of the Levitical priests doing this when Christ has fulfilled that. She says, quote, when enough of us have offered sacrifices like the priests of old in the name of the people for the world's sins, the pent up current of the redemption of Jesus Christ will rush upon the minds of men and heal the soul sickness that breaks out in a rash of war. So we stand continually between the Redeemer and his people, channeling his love to them. No, that's not right. Jesus Christ, again, as we've said before, is the only mediator. And he fulfilled the law and the words of the prophets according to himself and what he spoke in the Gospels. So we are not to, it's not based on our works. Again, and also this too goes into a works-based system. When we've done enough, then Jesus can come. When, when we've done this or we've done that, then Jesus can do and do this and do that. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. So that was one book that I read by her by The Healing Light. Now, I'll share a few passages just for time's sake from the other book I read, which was called The Healing Gifts of the Spirit. And this one was equally troubling because when I started reading through it, some of the things she talked about, which she did devote a chapter to inner healing in this book in particular, just some of the things that she talked about were rather troubling. And again, it was just more red flags of understanding this is not biblical teaching and this is something that we are to mark and avoid And again, I'm going to reiterate this. What does it matter? I'm reading a bunch of quotes from a woman that's passed away decades ago. What does it even matter? Well, it matters because this is the root and the foundational source of inner healing. And again, if the root is is bad, the fruit is bad. Regardless of what it looks like or the experience or anything else like that. So in the book, The The Healing Gifts of the Spirit... She says, quote, there was a time when I so envisioned God and felt vaguely apologetic at the efforts of man, often crude and distressful, to improve upon God's creation. But now I know that God wants man to improve upon his creation. Man's work upon this earth is merely the continuation of the plan of God, wherein nothing remains unchanged, but all grows and develops from one stage to another. Indeed, it seems at times as though God rested from his work of creation after he made man. 
waiting and watching to see how man would get on with it. She quoted Genesis 2, verses 2, where God rested on the seventh day to prove her point. She said, It is the very plan and intention of God then that man created upon this earth shall continue to create. And I think we've already talked about that before. She says in this book, But some of you who read this book may be wondering, why don't these people in trouble simply go to Jesus Christ? Should they not receive their help directly from him instead of from trees and birds and playing the piano and carpentering? Of course they should if they were well enough in soul. These people cannot go to Jesus unless you carry them into his presence. I'm going to ask a sincere question here. Where does it tell us in scripture what she just said? I encourage you to look for that and to see if you can find it. And I would strongly hold to the belief that you're not going to find that. People are told to come to Jesus. They are not told to go to birds, to trees, to piano playing, to carpentering, to look for solace. They are told to go to Christ. They're not told to clean themselves up before they go. Again, why do we need to do that if we don't need a Savior? There would be no point of Jesus coming if we had to, if we had to do all these things before we can go to him. There's, that's the point. We have to go to him in order to be made whole. She says the best thing they can do without a healer is to find peace through the silent voices of the stars and of the stones and of the humble grass and the small creatures that live in it and to find life through creating life by God's help with any tool that is theirs to use. Their ability to sing or to polish furniture, to plant flowers or to plan businesses. Jesus said that he came to those who are sick and in need, not the well. She said when applying for prayer, when applying the prayer for faith, she said, that every cell in the body has a rudimentary mind and will hear your words. When speaking of being healed from headaches herself, she said that the headaches were not completely healed until years later when the memories were healed. So this is where the inner healing part comes in. She tells of making pictures in her imagination of the thing that she purposed in prayer. And this, again, is an occult practice and a new thought practice. And new thought is stemmed into word of faith. She says, when speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a power, an energy, the water of life. And when that power is not given forth to the whole congregation from whence the group sprang, when that energy is not used to awaken life within the body of Christ, when the water of life is kept and hoarded rather than being freely expended, then the water stagnates, the energy is turned off, the power dwindles. No, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is not an energy. He is not a force that what she just said. He is not a power like that. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and his power does not diminish. And so this is putting the power in our grasp by what she is describing and diminishing the sovereignty and omnipotence of God. In her chapter, we'll talk a little bit about the inner healing part here. In her chapter on inner healing, on the healing of memory, she refers to the book of common prayer in the exhortations, which is used by the Episcopal Church, and she also refers to the confessional. She states that the most important duty of the priest— is to pronounce the absolution, to say that by his authority as a priest, the authority handed down all the way from Peter, he pronounces the absolution and remission of all the sins of the penitent. And we know that we do not have to go before uh, a person as such and ask them to forgive us of our sins. We can go before Jesus Christ uh, and in prayer and ask and ask for forgiveness. He is the, the divine mediator. Of Christ, she says, quote, Our Lord, when he took our sins and sorrows into himself, made the connection with all of us. He became forever a part of the mass mind of the race, so that even though his living being is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, a part of his consciousness is forever bound up with the deep mind of man, for this healing of memories is redemption. Are you troubled yet by what you're hearing? I'm just, I'm just curious. She says when she prayed for people, she prayed for the love of Christ to come into that one and forgive the sins and heal the sorrows of the past as well as the present, the little child who used to be, as well as the grown person who is now. She says, I begin at the present and go back through the memories, mentioning every sin and every grievous incident that has been told me. Indeed, I go farther back than this and pray for the healing of the impression of fear or anger that came upon the infant far beyond the reach of memory. I carry this prayer back to the time of birth and even before birth and pray for the restoration of the soul, for the healing of the soul, the psyche of the real originated person. So we're starting to see a few things here that are troubling and also an an adoption of the uh, the psychological aspect of this and fusing it into Christianity, the healing of memories even going back, she says, even before birth. How you would do that, I don't know. But anyway, this is, again, this is where the inner healing is coming into play here. And, and I, again, strongly encourage you, if you've been involved in this or have had questions about it or have been considering it, please get into Scripture and understand what real healing, inner healing is. And don't 
get wrapped up into this because this, this is something that is, is dangerous and it's troubling. It's not rooted in scripture. She says in the healings of the memories, the one who prays relives it for him in the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ with a pain that is brief because the Lord turns it into peace and possibly with tears of compassion, but not a heartbreak. And since the spirit transcends time, there is no need for months of beating one's breast and reliving old sorrows. Well, if that's the case, then, then what is the point of inner healing if, if that's not the case of what she just described? It seems that it's contradicting itself with, from what she just described. And we don't need to continue. If we've repented of sins and we've turned from those ways and we've, we've submitted ourselves to God and to his word and let the word of God renew our minds and that we are really understanding what it means to be sanctified and set apart for Christ and that we understand what it means to be mature and be led by the spirit of God and really be spirit filled, then we're not going to have to continue to five years down the road, feel like that we have to repent of a sin that we don't even, we're not habitually, we're not even in practicing it anymore that we've turned from those ways, but yet we're taking on this bondage of we have to be sozoed every couple years or have this happen or that happen instead of going to Christ in prayer, going before the Father in prayer, understanding that we have that ability as children of God and doing this in a biblical way instead of making a yoke on people that is putting a burden on them and yoking them with bondages. Of Christ, she said, he it is who once descended into hell and who therefore is quite at home in the deepest hell of our being. When retelling the story of a priest, she said the priest did not really believe in the forgiveness of sins, which is really the healing of the memories. And this is not true, the forgiveness of sins. That The healing of memories is not the forgiveness of sins. Regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, she said she describes the joy of the Lord, the gift of peace, and the gift of truth, and she compares them to three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. And she said when these three colors are combined in perfect purity, then they resolve into the white light of creativity. She says, I imagine God the Father receiving us again into himself and making therefore a new merger of God and man, a new sending forth of the original Spirit of God in interpenetrating the redeemed Spirit of man in a new way. She said when speaking of herself and friends praying together, God gave us a sign, a deep burning within the head, as though a spiritual power were awakening even the physical channel of brain cells, nerves, glands, whatever they might be, through which our power would increase. She said, we can enter into the accumulated thought vibrations of the ages and feel the feelings and think the thoughts of someone who lived long ago. And I have a what on here as well. So just hang on tight and listen. She says, quote, many take this as proof of reincarnation, but I do not so consider it. We do not need to live again and again in life for we live presently in all time. If we did, but not if we did, but know it, the vistas of prayer that this opens staggers the imagination. Can we send our prayer power back through time? Is this what Jesus did when he descended into hell and prayed for the spirits who were in prison in the time of Noah? Is this to come down to something nearer to our experience, the explanation of the prayer for the healing of the memories? How much greater we are than we ever have known. This is not an explanation of true prayer, nor are we able, ever able and told in Scripture that we can pray the prayers of someone who lived long ago and think their thoughts. That is an occultic practice again. The unconscious mind, she says, of man does not live alone. There is a mysterious connection between the unconscious being of one person and the deep mind of another. Moreover, this connection can reach back through time and forward through time and can make rapport with the thinking of someone who lived long ago or of someone who has not yet come upon the earth. She talks about contemplative prayer just for time's sake. I will not get into that, but she talked about a contemplative prayer in a, a certain capacity. She talked about the discerning of spirits. When she discerned spirits and prayed for others, she stated that she directed this departed thing into the hands of Christ, who will know how to deal with it. She said, I do not condemn or hate it, for there may be something in it which can be saved. And if by chance they are not evil, but only lost ones, and if you send them forth not in anger, but into the hands of Christ, then you know not work you may be accomplishing in the unseen as well as the seen. You, being in the flesh and adhering bravely to it, desiring not to see or to hear that which is forbidden, nevertheless may release into the hands of the Lord some lost and wandering soul who is held to the psyche of a living person in a vain attempt there to find life. Again, where is this in Scripture? She's describing someone, a person who has departed, and that they are inhabiting a, a, a body of another person. 
and sending that person out, whether they're evil or not. She doesn't want to discern that and just and judge that, but she wants to send them back to Christ and believe that they're going to be redeemed. And finally, in this book of the gifts of the healing, the healing gifts of the spirit, she says of Peter walking on water. She said, quote, he no doubt was upheld by the same principle of levitation, lightening the weight of the body that Jesus himself knew how to use, end quote. I've read several quotes to you from two books from Agnes Sanford. And again, I read them because this is the person that founded inner healing. Again, whether it's called Theophostic Prayer, Sozo, Father's Ladder, Inner Healing, Deliverance, whatever you want to call it, this is the foundation from which inner healing and all those that are associated with it come from. And this is important because it's not rooted in Scripture. It's not rooted in proper biblical understanding. And I am extremely concerned personally about those who subject themselves to these practices. And they have no idea to what they have submitted themselves. This is not biblically based nor founded in truth. And it's coming as a light, but it is darkness. And it is putting bondage on people and even opening them up to demonic spirits. And so these are some of the things in closing I want to talk about biblically speaking. We are not to be deceived. The Bible makes that clear is that we are not to be deceived. And how can we keep ourselves from being deceived? By staying in the Word of God. By believing, first and foremost, that the Bible is authoritative for our lives as believers. That it's sufficient in helping us and training us up for righteousness. In for correcting us. For, for rebuking us. For reproving us. It is, it is sufficient to give us what we need. God didn't miss anything in His Word. And it is able to help us as believers to know how to walk maturely and to discern properly. Our moral choices determine our actions and responsibility falls on us. I would encourage you to read Ezekiel 18 verses 19 and 20 regarding this. This helps us to understand that we are responsible for our own actions, our own failures, our own sins. Uh, We are not responsible for our ancestors' sins. We are not responsible for ancient ancestors that we're not aware of and their sins. We are responsible for our sins and our moral failures and our actions alone. And we, that's why we need a savior because we need to be redeemed. We need to be made whole and forgiven and washed clean. We can't do that for somebody else, but we can go before Christ, repent of our sins, trust in him in faith alone and be saved by grace through faith. There is no biblical precedence that any prophet or apostle in the Bible dealt with inner healing in their personal lives, nor taught this as necessary in the life of believers. Some examples I'll provide for you are Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We need to realize that the Bible is truth. And when the Word of God says it, that's what it means. We are a new creation in Christ. Just like 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are in a now but not yet state. None of us are in our glorified bodies on this earth. But we are promised that in eternity, that we will be glorified as Christ has been glorified in in our glorified bodies. And in the meantime, we are promised eternal life, that we have a hope and a joy that we look towards living in this now type state. That though we have a fleshly tent that is decaying and it's disintegrating and it's breaking down over the years, we have the promise of eternal life. We forgive others because the Lord has forgiven us. We do not need to forgive God and he does not apologize to us. I have seen this in Sozo teaching. I have read books on Sozo and one of the, in one particular, I remember a person saying that God asked for them to forgive God. God does not ask for forgiveness, nor will you ever hear God ask for forgiveness. That is another spirit. That is a false spirit coming, a false Christ. God has no reason to ask for forgiveness because God is not a sinner. Sinners ask for forgiveness. God does not. He does not apologize to us. God is incapable of sin or committing trespasses. We ask God to forgive us of sin and trespasses that are ultimately against him. I would refer you back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 for that. And finally, we do not give Jesus permission to do anything. He is God. He doesn't need our permission. He commands our obedience. I hope you found this teaching helpful. I hope it's been a blessing and maybe it's even challenged you to look into things on your own and to see and to test things according to scripture, which is what we are told to do as believers in Christ. 
My goal is not to condemn anyone or to beat anyone up or to make them feel less than, but it is to challenge and encourage each and every one of us to be willing to not just get comfortable with what we've been told through the years and handed down and not even spent time looking in the word to see if something were so like the Bereans did with Paul in Acts 17. But we are commanded in scripture to test everything. And I say this because I am genuinely concerned about those that would adopt practices like this and others that are leading them away from God, that are ultimately putting bondages on them that tell them you have to jump through these certain hoops in order to be saved, in order to be delivered. I think that our uh, understanding of deliverance has gotten off kelter because we are not getting into the word to see what deliverance really means as believers in Christ. We are adopting practices because of who a person is, their following, their, their weight in their speaking and their, their speech and their uh, profundity when, when they minister, their charisma. We're not questioning things and we need to question. Questioning does not diminish someone's value. It's really putting the value where it's supposed to be on God and his word when we question things, that we honor God so much that we don't want to miss the truth and we don't want to be led astray. And I hope that when you listen to this, that you understand, as for me, as for a believer, I am fallible and I recognize that. And that's the reason why I share these things is because there were things that I was involved in. I didn't realize that they were leading me astray. And I'm thankful that I wasn't involved in things like inner healing and such. At the same time, there were other things that I was involved in in these movements that were not leading back to Christ and they weren't honoring him, even though I desired to honor Christ and to love him with all my heart. But in truth, I couldn't do that because I'm fallible. And there was no way for me to do that because I needed him. I needed a savior to, to, to save me, to redeem me, to deliver me, and to give me eternal life. And so in closing, I just share these things to help others. So please open your Bibles, test what I'm saying, test it against scripture, make sure that it is so, and make sure that what you're following is leading back to the true Christ. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.